engineers. Good morning. Good morning. 11 o'clock. Yeah. Outstanding. We just need to get a hair smarter and then we are good. All right, we are going to look at another awesome shear moment diagram problem. And it would seem that I'm not organized enough to do that. A little bit of music in the background to kick things off. Share a screen. for the trapezoidal load that I introduced to you a little bit last time. And I will have to regrettably turn Super Freak off, or at least down. Let's see, thinking out loud, what's going on? So I mentioned last time we are, this is our or last second to last week and the end of that week. Um, I am grading homeworks and keeping them into my open math. I think I'm a, a few of you still have to grade chapter nine and you were giving me chapter seven after this week. Um, we are going to review for the third midterms, not a final exam, but as you may have noticed, um, the things that we're doing in this third section are really drawing on everything we've done this entire class. Well, it's not quite everything, but at least the important things. Um, and so there's a review in my open math already. And so my intention really Tuesday next week is to do this balance beam review slash um, review, like the review for the last test. And then we'll take the test on Thursday and be done with dynamics or statics and moving on to dynamics. Actually, since you're here, how many of you need to, want to, or planning to take Dynamics. I mean, it's just just curious. I, don't, I haven't looked to see numbers. Evold is going to take it. What about you, Aaliyah, Ben, and Landon? Are you guys taking dynamics? Yep. Landon's in. Not required to. I was kind of want to though, but I'll see if. Yeah, you're mulling it I over can a little or bit. Not. I can't or not. Have to do some other math classes instead. But sure. What about you, Aaliyah? Send it in the chat if you can't. If you're Internet connections, wonky. Hello. Hey, there you are. Are you? Oh yay! Not lagging much today. Um, I'd like to, cause it sounds awesome. But my advisor mentioned that it wasn't actually required. Sure. So I think I'm out of date on what I thought was required or not. So I'm not sure. Yeah, time and money depends on what kind of an engineering field you're going into. You may or may not need it. So. That is interesting. Let's see. What do I feel like there's something else I wanted to say? <laughs> Sheer moment diagrams. Oh, yeah, there was something else I wanted to say. Do, 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 distributed linear load. Please tell me I did not throw linear load away. I want to, I got to find this really quick. This will just take a second. Do, 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 engineering 211 class notes, 2021, third midterm, linear load. Oops, can't put it over there yet. Got to open up Google Drive. I knew there was something else I wanted to say. Near load. Uh, 
Okay, it's in the house. Now I can go get it. That's not good. So that means I posted the blank answer. Do, do, do. Oh well, let's not do it and say we did cancel. Get out of there. Let's just I'll show you inside the context of today's problem. Okay, so all we want to do is just see if we can deepen our understanding of all the things you take away from this class. Um, this might be one of the neatest, and and some of that's because as we saw the other day, like calculus, the fact that shear and moment are actually related based on derivatives and integrals is really kind of a beautiful, powerful idea. Plus, as I, as I think I made clear the other day, like this is it. I mean, you're doing it now. Like you put, if you put a load on this beam and you can actually understand the two things that might break it, shear and moment, and then go choose the correct beam, like this is the backbone of what engineers do. And so let's see if we can figure this out. Um, and I'd, I'd like to try to let you I don't know if the right word is get a little bit ahead of me here. Um, but let's do this. Um, I do want to change one thing really quick that I see that looks kind of weird. Let's change this 111, that, that 111, or that 11, let's change it to 110. That doesn't even look to scale. Even that doesn't really look to scale, but at least it looks better than it did. So let's say that's 110 pounds a foot. The beam's 18, 18 long. And awesome. So what's the first thing? What's the first thing that you've got to do to get started on this problem? I'm going to pick on people. What about Aaliyah? What have I got to do to get started with this type of question? Either find the reactions or find the um, the the resultant force of each of the rectangle and the triangle, and then combine them. That's right. Those are kind of tied together. In other words, I got to figure out what's happening at A and B. So the the first thing that I've got to do is figure out reactions. So again, try to get ahead of me. I'll start, I'll try to go slow enough that you have a chance to pull that kind of pull that off. And again, I'm going to do as I did the other day, I'm going to call this the force at A in the y direction. And this is the force at B in the y direction. And a subtlety that I won't talk about, but notice that 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 beam is not sitting on a point, it's actually sitting on a wall with a thickness, and like in a real house, that's usually five and a half inches. And so if that's an 18 foot beam, it's not actually spanning 18 foot 18 feet. Does do you agree that's kind of a bit of a complexity um, that's added to this? So that's kind of interesting to think about. But we'll keep it simple and think of it as a simply supported beam supported at a point. And so the important thing that I mentioned going out the door last time was the fact that, that we've got to come up with a division here. So there's a triangular and a rectangular load. And so, of course, the rectangular load is going to be right here in the center. And that's fairly easy because it's 110 pounds per foot times 18 feet. 110 times 18, I get 1980. So there, 1980 pounds are focused right in the middle at nine feet. That takes care of the rectangular load. But then we've got this triangular load now. And we know that's two thirds of the way in. And notice I chose a beam that makes two thirds of the way in kind of easy. So it'll be 
12 feet over. Let's see what color we're going to do this one in. Green seems like a good color. So I'll just kind of approximate where I think that is two thirds of the way in. I will say it's right there. So the triangular part of this load. Well, notice 700 is gone. In other words, 700 went all the way down. And so if I take that away, then just this chunk of it right there is 590. So we've got 590. It's just an area problem. I don't need an integral here because it's just an area of a triangle. So we said 590 times 18 times a half, whatever that is, 590 times 9. To save a second, I get 5310. So there, to Aaliyah's excellent point, I've just reduced that to two separate loads. There's not millions, there's just two now. And by the way, could you even combine those into one? Well, we won't do it, but could you use a moment calculation and add those together? Notice added together, what is that? 15310 plus 1980, that's 7290. If you wanted to, you could even go one step further and figure out, you know, where is that 7290 located? Maybe that'd be in some decimal location or whatever, but there's only two of them. So it's like, that seems like more trouble than it's worth, but you might, you might want to think about that. That's kind of cool. So now I'm all set to figure out the reactions. And so, I don't know, I'm going to find the sum of the moments around A. I have no good reason for that. Some of the moments around A. So I've got force of BY pushing up and causing counterclockwise rotation, which is positive, at a distance of 18 feet. I've got force of 19 80 at a distance of nine feet pushing clockwise. So that's negative. And 5310, way more. Notice the drawing's not to scale. 590 is way bigger than it appears. 5310 times the distance two thirds of the way in from A, and that'd be 12 feet. And all of that, of course, thanks to statics, thanks to equilibrium, has got to be zero. And so that leaves the force of B in the Y direction at 50, at 43, 45, 30. And then as we said, I could switch to the sum of the forces in Y, but for some reason I don't want to. I'm going to find the sum of the force. I'm going to find the sum of the magnitudes or the sum of the moments around B. It's more trouble. It's a waste of time a little bit. But then I think, okay, well, now all of a sudden notice that 1980 is also a distance of nine away, but does it make sense around B? 1980 times 9 is actually causing counterclockwise rotation, so it's positive. And so is 5310. But notice from B, 5310 is only 6 feet away from B. Throw 6 in there. And then force of A is actually negative. Force of A in the y direction is negative, and it's also a distance of 18, and I need that to be equal to 0. And so if I crunch those numbers, the force of A in the Y direction, I end up with, why do I suddenly feel the need to change colors? It's just so much funner to look at when it's different. Force of AY comes out to be 2760 pounds. So let's say I was taking the test, or maybe even better, I'm getting paid $80,000 to be an engineer, and I don't want to get this wrong. Like, how can I check that? The forces that are going down should equal the forces that are going up. Exactly. So... Let's, let's add this here just to slow down. I mean, this is like final exam preparation. This is exit knowledge. Check. 
let's check to see if 40, 45, 30 going up plus 27, 60 going up. And I could say add all of these together and set them equal to zero. And of course the two down ones would be negative or I can just do what, what Evold said and just say, make sure that the ones going up and the ones going down are equal to each other. And so check, bam, they are, love it. Okay, so I know I have not screwed up or at least I'm reasonably sure and so now I'm free to move on to some kind of a free body diagram. And let's get that done for, again, the left side. Although in this case, it doesn't really matter as much. Hmm, let me think about this for a minute. Do we actually want to switch to the right side just for the fun of it? Now let's stick with the left. So I want to see, can you draw the free body diagram for that left side? I'm going to give you a second to think about that. Hey, Dad, are you here? see my friend. How did it go? I'm going to catch up to you. Free body diagram. I chose left. So let's get this thing looking good. Work on your drawings. Remember, you're in this class not to get an engineering degree. What are you really in this class for? You're not in here to get an engineering degree. What do you get? What are you in this class for? To get an engineering. Learn how to think. Job. Oh. Mob. You want a job. Oh. <laughs> Ultimately, I mean, you want your degree. But you also want a job. And so, you know, I'm wondering, like, is your work such that if you showed an engineer your work while you were interviewing for a job, you know, would, would you would you be getting better at your sketching and your labeling of things? Can you write in such a way that's readable? So we said that force of AY was 2760. Again, the beauty of a free body diagram is the fact that this, this little chunk of the beam is actually floating in space. And so I have 110 pounds per foot there, all the way up to whatever that side is, which is some indistinct measurement that I don't know. But I do know that I am a distance of x away from where this cut is. Let's 
Let's see, what is my free body diagram still missing? You tell me, what's it missing? Our shear and moment. Yeah, it is connected to something. It is a fixed connection, which gives us a force in Y. There's a resistance to force in Y, which we are now calling shear because it's just the internal, that's the internal name for the beam itself. It's not actually supported there. And conventions, a moment. Now, that's still not quite complete. Do you understand why? It's darn close. But I don't have all the information I need there. And the reason I don't is because I don't know how long that is. Does that make sense? In other words, the angle that I drew that at, like the 110 is the distance of the short or sort of the, the force on the short side. But how tall is that side going to be over there? Does it make sense? I don't have anything on my diagram that's going to tell me that. So let's think about that a little bit. This is a powerful concept. So let's think about that. If I go back up to this original shape up here, didn't we? Didn't we the other day when it was just a triangle, would you agree that the, let's see, is there room to put this here? I think I'll try. Would you agree that the slope of that line up there is a rise of 590, not a rise of 700? It's a rise of 590 pounds per foot and a run of 18 feet. That's its slope. So when I divide 590 by 18, unfortunately, I don't get a nice clean answer to that. Um, if you're a perfectionist, it comes out 295 over 9. So basically, you can just divide that by 2. That's kind of unfortunate. I'm going to round it off. I don't really see that any reason why we couldn't round this off. I'm going to call it 32.78. So that's the slope. And remember, the units of that is kind of cool because this is actually pounds per foot per foot. So that slope is pounds per foot per foot. So then down here, if I write this equation, would you agree that it is 32.78 pounds per foot per foot times x feet, which makes it pounds per foot again? See, that's my formula. That's my formula that will tell me how much force I have, except it's still missing something. Because you may notice it doesn't work. Like what happens if you put in x is 0? Aren't you supposed to get 110? And yet if you put 0 in, you get 0. Like this is the triangular answer. So for that reason, if you will, the y-intercept of this is 110. In other words, this thing had to start at 110. The slope we just found a minute ago, remember, didn't, didn't recognize the fact that we took that line and slid it up 110. And so just like the y-intercept in a graph, there's the equation. Now to check it, let's figure out what is w. What is w if we put in all 18 feet? And what I'm wondering is, will I get that 700? that's on the other side, because that was the only two things I knew that defined this thing. And so I'm wondering, question mark, will that equal 700? And so I take 32.78 times a distance of 18 plus 110. And although I don't get the exact answer I was looking for, I get 700.04. And so it's like, oh yeah, that's right. I rounded off 0.78. So of course it's a little off. If you're a perfectionist, then you don't 
leave that slope looking so weird. But remember, we're going to be using all this to look up beams. And so engineers are less perfectionist. They typically are not going to do that. Now I've got everything I need. So basically now I have a formula that will tell me what force is pushing down on my beam dependent on what value I pick for x. Does that concept make sense? Bam, free body diagram. Done. Now I can go after all the other cool stuff that I want to know, like shear, which we call V. And I really want the equation for that, right? I mean, I want, I want the equation for shear. And I really want it as a function of x. In other words, we're finding all shears, right? Is that the concept sinking in as to what a shear diagram really is? It's all shears. What have you learned about shear? Where's the maximum shear going to be on this? Where do we, do you already have a sense of that? Where's the most shear going to be on this beam? Well, presumably right on the edge of the B support. That's exactly right. It's right where the support is. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? There's all this weight up there, but there's nothing, there's nothing pushing against it. Whereas if you move right against B over there, right against A, isn't there a board? So you got all this weight pushing down. And now on that end, you got this board pushing up. Well, that's that's what causes stuff to shear, right? That's what if you're pushing one way with one and one with the other. Isn't that what scissors do? One comes down, one comes up, chop, shears it off, shears your paper off. And so I need something coming up and something coming down. Now we don't need to know that, but, but that's what we saw in the last two problems. So I already kind of know the biggest shear is going to be at A or B, and you should even know it's at B because isn't there more weight over there? So I already know the maximum shear is over there at B, but that's just kind of cool to think about. But I need the equation. And so, of course, what we do is we say, cool, shear is really just forces in the y direction. And so I need the sum of the forces in the y direction. So what are those? Well, I'm in the mood to be lazy. So I'm going to start with the easy one, 2760. That's going up. U. You think more about that. I want you to try to write out the rest of the shear equation before I do it for you. Get it wrong so that if I, if I happen to correct you, then you're like, oh, okay, I see. You're at a place where you should be kind of able to do this on your own now.
check it out. So then you got V going down. That's straight down. So notice 2760 V, those are straightforward. And then I got all that green weight. What are you going to do with all that green weight? Do you understand that this shear equation, in a sense, could be could be placed over here? I mean, in a sense, because X has been defined as being right there. In other words, they're at X. Then isn't that the length? That's the that's the weight right there. And there's more than one way to do this, but but in the past, haven't we just been finding the areas of things? Well, you you know how to find the area of a trapezoid. Area of a trapezoid. Now, again, I could do this with a triangle plus a rectangle, but I'm just going to do the area of a trapezoid this time. Area of a trapezoid is the average of the bases. That'd be 110 plus 32.78 x plus 110. So I have to average the two bases and then multiply by the height. Isn't that true? Is that what the area of a trapezoid is? And notice in this case, I don't care where that's located. So I actually got all the weights put together here. I'm going to erase this, but if we did it the way we did a minute ago, wouldn't it just be 110 times X? That'd be the rectangle. And then it would be plus that 32.78 X plus 110 but then you'd have to subtract 110. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Those would be gone because that was just the triangle, right? Times the distance of So that's actually the weight of the of the triangle. That's kind of the weight of the far end of the triangle times the distance of x times a half. Like those two equations are going to be identical. They're going to be the same exact equation. Although I'm staring at them right now just to make sure that that's true. Yeah, they are. So let's see, I guess that's half of 110 plus 110. So that's 110. And then half of 32.78, I have that still sitting in my calculator. So if I say cut that in half, I get 16.39. So I multiplied everything by half. Now I got to multiply everything by X. And since 32.78 was already multiplied by X and it gets multiplied by X again, isn't that my, my weight, my W, if you will? And it's all down. That whole thing is going down. So minus, I'll put it in parentheses for now, just so that you see it as one thing. 16.39x squared. And so, boom. And this, of course, is all got to be zero. My floating section, it's not touching anything. It just has arrows pointing at it. In order for that to stay put, just like a minute ago, the entire beam, the sum of the forces in Y needed to be zero. The force of the some of the forces in Y for any section also need to be zero. So if I solve that for V, do I not get? By adding V to the other side. I remember I made some mistakes yesterday, like getting a little too much of a hurry here. So if I add V to the other side, I see that I have 2760 left over 
and then minus 110x, and then minus 16.39x squared. So I now have the shear equation. Again, as a function of x, which I think is kind of cool to write. This is why mathematicians do this. Don't just say v, say v of x. And that's just kind of cool to say, well, now I know, now I know all the shears. And, and if you know, um, if you agree with Landon a second ago that the maximum shear is going to be at x is 18, Right now, you could stick x is 18 in for that, and you'd actually have the maximum shear. But if you didn't know that, then you'd say, well, I better draw the diagram because I'm not really sure where the biggest value is going to be. How are we doing? I'm either looking at your face, Evan, Ben, I want to see thumbs up, thumbs down, or Landon, Aaliyah, you guys aren't showing me your face. Hit the thumbs up, thumbs down. Like, I, this is it. Like, we're done. I'm, we're reviewing right now. You're, there's no more to teach you. As I said, I'm probably going to give you a triangular problem on the test, not a, not a trapezoid, but I'm very interested you understand this. So stop. Stop and ask questions if you do not feel good about this. Uh, so far, it makes sense. The uh, only really weird sections are just the conventions for you know, direction of shear and uh, whatnot. Well said. And that would make more sense if we had time to do this problem on the right, left side and then on the right side and to see that to get the same answer, we'd have to switch those conventions. But you've noticed all term that signs are kind of annoying, right? In other words, so now I want to show you something else I've never showed you before. Just a little side note. Life is beautiful. Check. If you take the integral of the weight formula, you will get the shear formula. We're actually proceeding through, when you go this direction, if you will, so we're going from the weight in pounds per foot And we're moving ourselves to shear, which is actually in pounds. Think about that for a second. If I drew a graph where this unit was pounds per foot, and this unit over here was feet, and I had some graph like this, wouldn't the area under that curve be pounds per foot times feet? Do you agree with that? This is one of the coolest applications of Calc 2. So the, the purple graph, its unit is pounds per foot. So if this is the W axis up here, and this is the X axis over there, that's what W and X mean, the area into that curve would be pounds per foot times feet, which is actually pounds, this unit would be pounds. That's why the integral of that equation gives us shear. So if I take the integral of 32.78x, don't you add one to the exponent, becomes 32.78x squared, but then you divide by two. Isn't that exactly what we did right here? 32.78 divided by 2 is 16.39. If you take the integral of 110, don't you get 110x? And then interesting, there's this constant here. 
Where would that come from? Remember when you took an integral, how technically you're supposed to put a constant out in front? Here's a place where you actually need to do that. So if you took the integral of that, you'd get plus a constant. And then you'd have to say, well, when I put V of zero in, I can see from my graph, I'm supposed to get 2760. So the only way that happens is if I add 2760 for my constant. So you actually cannot just ignore that plus C. That's just a side note. Do you see any other problem? There's one other small problem. Do you notice there's a sign problem here? Well, that's happening because if I come up here, aren't those arrows actually going down? Like, like back at the start when I said that was 700, that's actually negative 700, isn't it? Because it's pointing down. So I should be saying that's negative 700 pounds, but I just let the arrow take care of that. What I should be saying for my W graph here is those should be negatives. In other words, that should be negative 32.78x minus 110 so that the down is a part of the signs. And that's exactly why this these sign convention things come into play. I was just using common sense and saying, I don't, I don't want to work with negative 700. I just want to think of it as 700 and I'll just draw the arrow down so that then when I put it into the problem, I know it's a negative. But didn't we do that? Like when we got, when we got here, didn't we throw a negative? We threw a negative right here because we said it's down, right? So technically my W up there should have negative numbers in front of it if I want to let the signs do the work and I don't want to just use my common sense. Check. It worked. So I've got my shear equation. Let's go graph it really quick. Just because we can, we need to. Actually, let's let's do this by hand. Notice the shear equation is a parabola. Let's do it by hand this time, just, just in the interest of thinking. So there's a few things that I want to know. I certainly want to know what's V of zero, which is not surprisingly 2760. And I want to know V of 18, which is also not surprisingly, let's see, 2760 minus 110 times 18 minus 16.39 times 18 squared. I got negative. 4530. Why is that not a surprise? Isn't that the answers we thought it would be? Like we already knew what those loads were. So of course that's what the shear is going to be right there. And actually I had to round it to get that last one. I got 4053, 4530.36. Time, but if I hadn't rounded, I'd get this exactly right. Would you also agree the third place I'm really interested from what we discovered yesterday that's really fascinating is I'd actually like to know when this is equal to zero. From yesterday, Evel, from yesterday, why is it so cool to figure out where the shear is equal to zero? Because that's um, where we're going to have the, the biggest moment. Exactly. Put you guys on the spot and you're hammering it out of the park. because that's where the maximum moment will be. Well, what's really cool about this from all the algebra knowledge that you have? Sweet, I've got a quadratic formula to solve. I love it. I've got one in my calculator, program, quadratic formula, all equal to zero. My A value is negative 16.39. which is going to make this rounded off, which maybe bothers me a little bit. I'm trying to decide, do I care? Yeah, I do. It was actually negative 16.38888. So I'm going to put a bunch of eights in there instead. I'm putting negative 16.38888, a whole bunch of eights just to make it better. And then B is negative 110 and C is positive 2760. Notice it's in a different order. A is the number in front of X squared. You should remember not the first number in it. And when I did this, I got two answers 
I got negative 16.6776, which doesn't mean anything. But more importantly, I got the quadratic formula says that x is approximately 10.05 feet. So basically then, v of 10.05 is 0. Like those are the three... Those are the three pieces of information I, I really need to do a good job graphing this. As long as I know this is an upside down parabola because it's negative 16. And so now I could make a decent graph of this. Let's try to make a decent graph, even if we're just sketching it with a ruler. What might this look like? I'm gonna draw a decent line here. And it's going way lower down here to negative 4530. I'm already out of room. I'm going to scoot this baby over. Negative 4530. And the top was 2760. And this is shear in pounds. I should have that labeled. And then ripping across this way out here to a distance of 18. And notice it's kind of cool. This would be x in feet. Struggling to make ft happen. And notice 10 would be about here. Like it's past halfway. Isn't that kind of cool? It's not in the middle. It's not in the middle of the beam. We saw that yesterday with the triangular load. Of course, it's not in the middle of the beam. And so that's about, I mean, it's 10.03, so that's about 10. And so I basically have a point here, and I've got a point here, and I've got a point there. And if I know it's a parabola, then I just kind of kind of make a, it's not too bad for just a sketch. That is a pretty beautiful sheer diagram here diagram <coughs> and this is not a part of your assignment but it is important to realize that what you just discovered from this is that the vmax is 4,530 pounds. Again, negative, positive. You would tend to never report this as negative. By the way, if we had done this from the right-hand side, then we would have got a positive 4,530 and a negative 2,760. And that's why the sign convention thing comes into play. And so we would have got the same shear diagram, but it would have just reported the same information, but kind of from a different direction. Beautiful. Now, finally, the moment you have all been waiting for. The moment, how did I do that to make it look good? The moment, and ultimately I want moment, which is M, also an equation as a function of X. And I'm gonna copy my free body diagram down because I need it. I see I'm near the end of the page, so I think I'll just move all this down. So our free body diagram has the point A over here, but it also has this point. And let's let's do this the way Ben suggested yesterday, which is actually a lot easier. It doesn't make any difference. But the question is, what point do we do the sum of the moments around? 
and we're more than welcome to choose A to do it. But when we did that, it forced us to have a V in the problem, and then we had to substitute the equation V in, and, and I learned this playing around with this after class yesterday because I realized Ben's question was pretty insightful, and I thought, gosh, I'm not, that's kind of weird. I got to think about that a little bit. And so I'm going to call this point C. So it's actually better C for cut. It's actually better if you find the sum of the moments around the cut. Watch how it makes your life easier. Some of the moments around C, well, then that's C. That would be, well, notice V is pointing at C. Does it make sense V is pointing right at C? So there's no V. Yesterday there was a V, but no 2760. Today there's a 2760 at a distance of X. And in this case, that would cause it to rotate in the clockwise or negative direction. And then there's an M, which would be in the positive direction. And then, uh oh, here we go. Now it's on. Let's see. Do I want to break this into a triangle and a rectangle? I think I do because I'm thinking I'm gonna. It's gonna be too hard to find out where it's located. So I'd have 110 times x. That's gonna cause it to rotate in the also the positive direction. So would you agree that 110 times x is my force? And it would be in the middle of that. So it would be a distance of x over 2. That would be my distance. And collectively, that's for my rectangular portion of my load. You cool with that? And then we'd have this triangular load up here, and its force would be about there. And remember, the triangle is only the triangle. So the force up there is 32.78x. Why is it only 32.78x? Because I got to take 110 away from it. And since the formula had plus 110, I have to subtract 110. That's the force that's left over. Isn't that what we did earlier? It's a little confusing, but earlier didn't we say, when we first started this, didn't we say that was only 590 right there? Because we took 700 and took 110 away. So don't I have to do the same thing here? Except for instead of 700, I got this formula, 32.78x plus 110. So if I take 110 from that, I just get 32.78x, that's kind of cool. But then that's times the distance x times half. All of that, I'm going to do this underneath. All of that is the force. That's the triangular force. Do you agree with that? Wouldn't the distance be x divided either by one third or two thirds, depending on which way you're coming? That's right. And which way are we coming from since you brought that up, Aaliyah? Since we're going around C. Though we'd want one third. That's right, because it's two thirds on this side, but it's one third on this side. And so this time, since I went around C, it's only a third of x. That's our distance. And so collectively, all of that is our triangular load. And so all of that needs to be equal to zero. I think I got them all now. So do you see, like, this is really good because there's no V in it. If, if I had had a V in it, then I'd have to go substitute our V formula that we found a little while ago. I don't know where it went, but it was beautiful. Oh my gosh, I didn't box it. What am I doing? What am I doing? Should have been bombs going off. That's beautiful. 
So I'd have to get that equation involved. And because going around C left V out, and again, do you all agree V is pointing at C? Like I can't draw the arrow right there, but it's V is on the crack, it's on the split. So it's pointing right at C. So you can put V in it, it's just it would be times the distance of zero. And so here's where I screwed up yesterday. Like I'm trying to solve this for M now. So I'm gonna go a little slower not to screw this up. I see M is positive, so I'm gonna leave it on the left-hand side and subtract everything else to the other side. So there'd be a 2760X. There would be 110X squared divided by two, that'd be 55X squared, but I have to subtract it to the other side. So it'd be minus 55X squared. And then, woo, what about all this stuff? Let's see, one half times one third. So it's really 32.78 divided by six. And then it's X cubed, isn't it? 32.78 divided by six, 5.46. And then it's positive, so I'd have to add it to the other side. I'm sorry, it's, yeah, it's, I'd have to subtract it from the other side. So I get 5.46 X cubed. What am I doing to check this? Take the derivative of it to see if it matches your V equation. Yep, take the derivative of it, see if it matches my V equation. Or take the integral of the V. And by the way, we could have taken the integral of the V equation to create this equation. So let's see, derivative, what is the derivative of m with respect to x? This is my check. I don't trust myself. So that'd be 2760 minus 110x, 3 times 5.46 is 16.39x squared. Bam! Yes, it worked. Oh my gosh, I didn't miss anything. It's the exact equation I had for shear equals V. Check. Amazing. Box this bad boy. Boom. Oh man, that is glorious. Remember from our shear diagram. We already know that this intersection, we said X was 10.03, if I remember right, 10.05, I do not. 10.05 will be the location of moment max. So for that reason, I could actually go down here right now and find out M evaluated at 10.05. And in a sense, I wouldn't need to draw the, the moment diagram, right? I just, I'm just looking for the maximum. So I'm gonna stick, I'm gonna stick 10.05 into that 2760 times 10.05. So amazing. 2760 times 10.05 minus 110 times 10.05 minus 16.39 times 10.05 cubed. And that, I didn't say it out loud, but it's, a, but it's minus, <clears throat> it's minus 55 times 10.05 squared. And if I didn't blow all of that, I got, 55, 40, I'll say 46 foot pounds. So this is the max moment. I'm gonna double check what I typed in because obviously this would be easy to screw up. This is that, this is that. I did screw up because I wrote 16.39 when it was 5.46. It's a good thing I checked. And 
as a result, I got, I thought that number seemed kind of low. As a result, I actually got 16,640.5. So I'll call it 641. But, you know, again, it's interesting, like this is a complicated equation now, no, it's a cubed equation. And so, you know, I got to graph this thing. And so just go into your graphing calculator or go into Desmos. As I said, I don't care how you get the graph. Um, I know what parabolas look, I know what cubed equations look like, but it's like, you know, where's all the curves and so forth. I'm just going to go into my graphing calculator and type 2760 X minus 55 x squared. I'm just going to cheat. In other words, minus 5.46x to the third. And notice I have huge values. My maximum moment is 16,000. Like your, your normal graph is not going to show this. You're going to have to mess with the window a lot to see this thing. So, so you should understand. I, I should have done this for you to watch. Um, but you should understand with respect to your window, you know, if you're doing this in your graphing calculator, <clears throat> does it make sense your window? If you went to window, your X's would be between zero and 18. So X minimum zero, X max 18. And now that I just learned that my, because I, I thought a little bit, I actually know that my, my M max is 16,000. I'm gonna set my Y minimum to zero and my Y max to 17,000. And I should actually get a pretty decent looking graph. I should be able to see the whole thing. If I did not know that, I would have just had to play around until I finally got it right. And so what I see is something that looks like this. Goes out here to 18. Again, this is X in feet. In my opinion, you're not done until you actually label all of this. This is your moment in foot pounds. You got zero, you got zero. So it hits in both of those places. And remember that wasn't a surprise. Maximum moment happens where minimum shear is. Minimum moment happens where maximum shear is. They kind of like play against each other a little bit. If a beam's gonna break, it's gonna break in the middle, right? Because that's where, that's where all the bending is gonna happen. So the maximum moment will happen in the middle where there's nothing to support it. The maximum shear happens at the end where something's pushing against it. And so you have that slicing like scissors motion and what you get here is, and this is what it would take to make a decent sketch of it, just do this. Like you can trace on your graph and cheat, just trace along the graph and cheat and, and get that 16,641 number, but it's just a little off center. And so you just try to draw, you know, kind of a rough sketch of So, you know, we live in an age of technology. A lot of you should be sort of profoundly unsatisfied with some ugly looking graph like that. I will say as, as a kind of a cool trick, if you just lay your hands in the right location, you can actually do a remarkably good job. I'm, I'm pinning my wrist. You can't see this, but I'm pinning my wrist. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm pinning my wrist to the ground. So it kind of acts like a, like a compass. And now I'm rotating this and doing it again at a different location. Notice that actually looks quite a bit better. Although it's not very round on top, it kind of came to a point. But the important thing is, is like amazing. You just made a moment diagram. Everything is labeled. And you can now answer the question, you know, what is my M max up there? And again, maximums happen where the derivative is equal to zero. Oh my gosh, the derivative of that equation is shear. And so that's why setting shear equal to zero actually gave us that maximum point up there. Side note, why were there two answers? There's two answers to a squared equation back here. When we solved that squared equation, there was a negative answer and I threw it away. That's because cubed equations really look like this, don't they? And so there's another 
minimum over there someplace, but that's in a place that doesn't exist for us. And so that's why it's not included, but it's just kind of cool to think about. <clears throat> now, I wish we had more time because I'd like to mess with, mess with, I want to say, I wanted to say you, but us. In other words, what if you had a beam that wasn't uniform? Everything we've done has been kind of uniform. I'm going to erase this, but you know, what if you went like from here to here with a linear force like this, and then from there you went triangular up to here, and then what if it went triangular down to the ground? What if that was your load? What would that your moment diagram look like? I mean, isn't that exciting? Like I was like, oh my God, I got to do that. That's so amazing. Um, that'd be interesting to see what that would look like. Or what if I came back and just, you know, on top of that even added like some, you know, bam, there's a thousand pounds just from nowhere. There's a point load. There's like a, there's a post. And, and, and by the way, this is not weird because I do this all the time in construction. Like what if there's a post right there and it's supporting a beam on the second story and there's a thousand pounds that is sitting on the beam on the lower story. And so I had all the regular load on the lower story, but then there was a point load on one section of the beam. Do that all the time, did it last night. Um, so, you know, what would that shear moment diagram look like? Um, it's gonna be real, it's gonna be a lot more sort of jaggedy. And of course there'll be one shear diagram while well, X is from here to here, but then when it gets past that and goes out to here, does it make sense it'll suddenly include that 1000? What's gonna happen is your shear diagram will be cruising along and then suddenly it'll go bonk and bump way up because suddenly it has a thousand pounds. It moved one more inch and suddenly bam, a thousand more pounds. And so it would jump way over to the right and then it would keep going up. And then suddenly it would kind of increase like it was maybe going up kind of like this and then suddenly bam, it went way up. Oops, that didn't work. This is the idea anyway. It was going up and then suddenly, bam, it jumped way up. And then it continued going up again. But then it started going up really quickly. Like from right there, it would actually really start getting steep fast. And so there's actually one graph here that might be a parabola. And then another graph there that might be a cube graph or something like that. Now it's still continuous, but it would be straight jump because of the point load. That's kind of what it looked like. And then and then maybe it would start leveling off. Like it would get up here and start leveling back off again, something of that nature. So you end up with a cool connected piecewise graph mathematicians call that. So it's just kind of fascinating. But you have the you have the basics now to produce that. That's the idea. I mean you you could learn that and you'll you'll spend more time with this and later classes if you are going structural engineering. So let me show you one other thing going out the door and then we can come back to this if there's something that you don't remember. But would like, will you write this down if you didn't write it down somewhere because you're gonna have to remind me. We got, we had a maximum moment of 16,641, right? That was our max moment. And then our max shear was 4530, right? I want you to remember those two numbers because that's all we need here. Do you understand that? Like that, that's, we did all of this just to get those two numbers. So now let's do what we did the other day, which is let's do a couple things. One of them is let's go to this design. Let's go to this sheet out of the Versalam book. Can you choose a beam now that will do that job? Again, we're looking at the two biggest things here, which is how much shear is allowable and how much moment is allowable for that beam. I need 16,600 for shear. So there we go. Does that work for, man, that's close. Did that work for, it works for moment because it was 16,600, but what was shear? I forgot, 50, 4530, right? So it works. So that beam would work. What is it? One and three quarter by 16. Would you agree that beam would hold the weight we just described? Is that the only one? No. 
this one would. Notice moment seems to be the one that's the biggest problem. That would, a two and five eighths by 14. If I move down to the next size up, three and a half, what would do it down there? This one would. That's a three and a half by 11 and a quarter. If I move down to the five and a quarter size, this would do it. Five and a quarter by nine and a quarter. If I move to the seven inch width, then notice, wow, those are huge. Like this way over does it like a seven by nine and a quarter. Does it make sense you would never want to choose that? Because back here was a five and a quarter by nine and a quarter. So why would you make someone buy a bigger, heavier beam when they don't need it? Okay. So let me show you something, one more thing, and then, uh, then we'll be done. I mean, I've never tried this before, so I'm, I'm all excited about it, but I, I I just looked a second ago for just quickly because I've never I've never put a trapezoidal beam a, a trapezoidal load on a beam. So I went this is what this is the design software that I've showed you before and we're going to try to do exactly what we just did a second ago. So our beam was 18 feet long. So I'm going to go over to here to spans. So this is what I'm doing every day. And, I, and again, I'm not doing engineering because they don't trust me and I don't have a stamp, like I can't stamp it. So they want to see this printout. So notice I'm saying I have an 18 foot beam. Um, I'll show you everything. Notice how it says out to out. See how that, let me hit enter so it shows up. So now there's our beam 18 feet long and it goes all the way to the outside but it's supported by three and a half inch wide wall. Does that make sense? So our calculation a minute ago was really sitting on two points. This is actually not spanning 18 feet. It's spanning 18 feet minus three and a half inches on each side, so minus seven inches. So it's really spanning 17 feet five. Does that make sense? So this is gonna be a little different than what we just drew. Um, I could go in here and change it to clear span. Take a look at the picture. Do you see how it changed the 18 feet to be between the two supports now? I think that's what we just did. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it there. Um, let's put a load on this. Notice there's one of my options right there. This is what I've never done before, a trapezoidal load. So we're going to put a trapezoidal load on this beam. And notice how it says the beam is 18 feet, 7 inches long. So to get it to look like what we looked, I'm going to have to start this thing at 3 and a half, which would be 8 sixteenths. So that's starting at 0 feet, 3 and 8 sixteenths inches, 3 and a half. That'll start the load not at the end of the beam, but where our support is. And then that's going to go all the way down to the end, which would be 18 feet seven, but I got to take off three and a half inches. So that'd be 18 foot three and eight. And then what is the load? Well, we had 110. Let's see. Start and dead load. Let's just go half and half. So 55, pound, 55 pounds of dead load. 55 pounds of dead load at the start. And 55 pounds of snow load at the start. That's 110, right? So we had 110 on one side. So 55 and 55. And then what about the end? We had 700, right? So again, I'm just splitting it in half and saying I'll make 350 of it dead load and 350 of it live load. Again, I don't know how this is going to come out. I've never done it before. But at least I'd like to look at the picture. 
Notice they don't waste much space drawing giant arrows up there. Do you see how you can't even see it? I mean, there is a little tiny length over there. It's like teeny, but they don't, you know, they're going to waste the whole page. They got to print this page off. So they don't show it much. Um, so it looks like it's okay. So now I go to, let's see, here's one place I'm a little confused. Tributary. So we treated our beam like it was a foot wide. So basically I'm treating my beam like it's a foot wide. So I think this is okay. It's a foot. Yeah, we're good. Now I'm going to go choose a product. Hey, we just did this a second ago. We just chose a product. Anybody remember what the products we chose were? Um, so watch, watch what I have to do. Like notice I'm not doing any math. I just typed in what I just typed in what our picture showed. And then I can just go in here and click on one of these beams. Notice I randomly clicked on a one and five sixteenths by seven and a quarter. That's really small. And notice it failed wildly. 800% overload. Like, come on, man. Don't you know anything? Um, so I can narrow it down. Like I can say, I only want beams that are three and a half inches wide. And so let's see, what if three and a half by eight and five eighths do it? Notice I just click on these until they aren't red. Oh, red. Like I'm not doing any engineering. Someone's programmed all this in there, but notice I'm in the ball game now. Well, 300%, that's not good. Let's go up to a three and a half by 11 and a quarter. I want to say that was the one we chose by the way. Notice it almost made it three and a half by 11 and seven eighths. Notice it still failed, but it failed on the third category that we haven't talked about yet. You'll talk about this in strength of materials next term if you're taking that class. But, but this beam won't break because of shear and moment, but a beam, if a beam bends down too far, deflection is how much does it bend down? This is saying, if you put this load on this beam, it's going to bend down 1.2 inches. That's considered failure because you can't bend more than an inch. Notice how the shear load, 4608, and the moment load, 117,000, are pretty close to the numbers we were calculating, right? There's a little nuance to this that, you know, like when I first looked at this, I was really bothered by the fact that it's like I did all these calculations and they don't match. Like I should get the same answer I got, the same answer as I got. And so, you know, why don't they exactly match? And there's some nuance to that that I, I honestly haven't completely sorted out. Um, but you see how like we were getting these numbers roughly. So haven't had a chance to show you and I probably won't because it's not something we're covering, but, but notice it still failed in deflection. Now as, as the person who's responsible, if the thing falls down, I'm really glad about this because do you see how it's gonna make me choose a stronger beam? I gotta go clear up to three and a half by 14 if I wanna keep it at three and a half. And notice now it will pass in deflection, but does it make sense it's really safe now with respect to all the other shear? Notice it's because that beam is so huge, the moment required was 17,000, but if you look at the three and a half by 14 inch beam on the chart, that's only 60% of what it can handle. So it's like, I'm, I'm safe, man. It's not going to break. You see what I'm saying? In shear, look at shear. It's only 43%. So this is almost like double big enough as far as it breaking. Not only that, but I've been through the factory and their beams actually regularly break at double what they say they will break. And so there's a lot of factors of safety built into all of this. And so fortunately, all we're really, all I'm sort of, the last thing to pass is always deflection. And in a sense, I don't care because that's not going to hurt anybody. Maybe it bends a little too much, but so what? And so in the end, this is what I end up doing. I go up here to this engineering report. Let's see, I think I just clicked on the wrong thing. I go up here to this engineering report. And what I'm required to do when I turn house plans in is print this out and turn it in. And all they're going to do is look at these percentages. They see that it's been done by, well, algebra and nobody's touched it, and so I can't screw it up. The only thing they check to see is, did the person put the right load on top of it and so forth. By the way, one of the details to this, that you, do you see how there's more, more up here than there was before? 
Notice the first load right there is self-weight. Like we, we pretended a minute ago, the beam had no weight, but does the beam have weight? Yeah, it does. Every beam you have has different weight. And so that's part of the reason our answer didn't exactly match. This beam can't be weightless. So that's some of the nuance to it. Um, let me show you one other thing. Check this out. I don't know this very well. Do you see what it says right there? Shear moment deflection diagram. In other words, it actually prints out, supposedly. Seems like I looked at this before and I wasn't super happy with it. But notice it's printing out those shear moment diagrams. Now what's bothering me is, notice it's telling us the maximum shear there is 8,900. I'm remembering now why this was bothering me. We saw on the sheet just a second ago, it was like 17,000. You understand that? And yet it's giving us a number here that's like half that size. It's like giving me half the number here. Um, I'm thinking out loud, is that because is that because half the beam is over here and half is over here, so you get to cut it in half? Notice the same thing happens with shear. Like I would have thought that read negative 4560, right? Isn't that what we got? 4530? And this was 2760 or something like that. It seems like those, those sizes are half. I, I don't know why that is. I haven't figured that out yet. But you see what I'm getting at? Like overall, you're now doing engineering. Like if you understand statics, and I've showed you a little bit deeper than what's in your book, of course, but, but it's like these are the calculations that one must make to choose a beam for someone's house. I'm doing this all the time, but I'm just taking advantage of a software program. Boise Cascade gives me this program for free. Why do they give this to me for free? Because it advertises their products? Yeah, and even more than advertises, I'm choosing them. In other words, this is not specking other people's products. And so when I get to my plans, I say, all right, this beam, this, uh, this one is roof beam 01. So right on my plans, it says roof beam 01 is a three and a half by 14 inch first land beam. Like I'm choosing their beams. And so when the person goes to build it, they're gonna say, oh, the engineer said, or the designer said it needs to be a three and a half by 14 inch first land beam. And so they're gonna call Boise Cascade and order the beam and then they make money. So, so that's kind of cool. Um, I'll show you one more thing really quick. I'm going into the drawings that I've done recently. I'll just pick, let's see, I just did this one last night. I just turned this one in last night. So I can't remember if I had any beams in it though. I guess I should have thought about that, but probably it does. going on? How come I can't get where I need to get? Can't see my cursor. Oh, that's why. So every time I turn a plane in, I've always got this little beam schedule here. This says to the person building it, you got to order Four beams. Notice one of them is very similar to what we just did. It's a five and a quarter by 14 inch Versalam beam. Notice it's called roof beam one. Where is it? Oh, it's right there in the garage. See how it's pointing right at it? So that beam right there, I, I plugged in, I looked at my plan and I said, you know, how long is this beam? That's a 16 foot beam. And I looked on my roof plan over here to see how much of the roof is on it. Can you appreciate that this would create a triangular load? Because it's the corner of the house. And so over here, you have a really long rafter. And so there's a lot of roof weight bearing on that part of the beam. Whereas over here, there's only a little short chunk that's on the beam that creates a triangular load. 
to, to avoid wasting time, I don't do that. I actually just pick the long one over here and, and kind of make sure. But that's actually causing a triangular load on that beam. And so I do what I just showed you. I start loading, I put, I put loads on that beam, and then I choose a beam that works. And then when I'm done, I print out, there's roof beam one right there. I print out that same printout that I just showed you with a whole bunch of percentages. Notice those percentages are close, but like the biggest one is 85%. Like I, I try to get them close to 100 because I don't want to, you know, make someone buy an expensive beam when they don't need to. But then I turn this I turn this beam calc in with the plans and then the city can kind of double check what I said. And then awesome. One other quick thing I wanna show you while we're in here since we're about done is notice the weight on the post. Would you agree that there's a bunch of weight up here and notice be, um, bearing one and bearing two. Do you notice bearing two has 3,200? Actually, let's look at the top one. Oh, by the way, notice this has a point load on it. There's an extra load. Think about the shear diagram and moment diagram. There's an extra load sitting on that beam. I can't remember why. Off the top of my head, I'm thinking, what? Oh, I think it was a truss. Yeah, there was a truss on it. Um, so it's got an extra load. And so notice that load is closer to, to bearing one. Therefore, bearing one is bigger. But notice it has 3,700 pounds here and 5,700 pounds there. Wow, that's like 9,400 pounds. Let's take a look at my plan, 9,400 pounds. What do you notice on the foundation plan right here next to the garage? Notice I added a giant footing, 32 by 32, because there's a whole bunch of weight right there. If you don't have a big enough snowshoe for 9,000 pounds, then that's gonna break and sink into the ground. And again, that'll be my fault if that goes wrong. So notice the one on the right where the bearing was is 32 inches, whereas the one on the left is only 30. And so that's part of what you would do as an engineer as well. Now I know how to do that, even though I'm not an engineer, and so I can design house plans, but, but you know, when you have to hire an engineer, these are all calculations they're making too. So every place I have a beam, notice there's extra footings there supporting them. Here's an extra footing over here supporting some extra load. All right, I've kept you too long. Stay after if you want. I've asked me any questions about what I just showed you if you're curious, but I want to give you permission to leave. You're always welcome to leave whenever you want to, but. You are now much smarter than you were three months ago, are you not? <laughs> yeah, that's cool stuff. Um, yeah, isn't it cool? Yeah. This was a house oh, in uh, Phoenix what? that burned down. So this oh, is a redraw for somebody oh, in Phoenix. Uh -huh. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I'll go. Thanks, Doug. Bye, everybody. See y'all. Okay, have a good day. All right. I'm closing her down. See y'all.